It's a thrill for me to be here, you know, especially in this valley. Many of you may be wondering, why do they bring someone with a Pakistani accent to talk to you? Do you need that? Let me tell you why. In the first place, you can't go anywhere because he's going to watch you. <laughs> but the real reason why they bring someone with a Pakistani accent to talk to you is you don't like my Texas accent, that's why. <laughs> now, it's interesting looking at your faces. Y'all supposed to be you know, diversity oriented. Y'all supposed to be, you know, everybody's the same. But all I had to do was go, I tell you it's a thrill for me to be here, you know. And that whole row went, oh my God, you should have seen your faces. Y'all should have seen your faces like, oh damn, all day. We're going to have them three times, oh damn. I can't understand them. <laughs> now, why do I start that old accent? How many of you have been told you have to make a good first impression? Raise your hand. Mama told you, Papa told you, you're going to make a good first impression. It's far more important, especially in your business with what you do, that you take a good first impression. Not that you make one. You see, we're all taught how to look just right and just be. Now, does he look like a banker to you? Give me a break. <laughs> But I'll assure you that he's taken a good first impression. If you don't take the, first, the good first impression, you're saying no to somebody who's willing to be loyal and pay up every dime that, you, that they owe you. You can't be making assumptions about somebody because of their accent, their background, or, or other kinds of things. And so then my first lesson is take a good first impression. And that's not my real accent either. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this is my third phony voice. If you want to know my real accent, you have to go to the Italian neighborhood that I grew up in New York and talk to my two brothers and my brother-in-law who still live there and ask him about me. They'll say, forget about it. He don't know nothing. You know what I mean? <laughs> my brother said, who the hell died and made you boss? He said, they pay you to talk? I said, yeah. He said, we used to pay you to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to tell you a little bit about my family. Uh, one time, we slept four boys in a bed. I had five children. Uh, my mother was a maid, left school in the sixth grade to go to work in a factory, and they found out she was 12, so they kicked her out, and she went to work in a hospital as a maid, and she found that she was 13, and they kicked her out. And so he sees me on television, he calls me. He goes, Joey, because you can't call three brothers and a sister. He says, Mrs. Irochi called me, Mrs. Conforti called me. He said, he said the Valerotti talked to me. They said, you're on television. How come you can't call me? He said, by the time I turned, you were halfway off. I said, well, my cell phone was dead. He goes, yeah, like you can't afford two batteries. <laughs> <laughs> and then he starts. He goes, not for nothing. How many know what an Italian means when they say not for nothing? Yeah, not for nothing is not a good thing, because this is going to be for something. He goes, not for nothing. You're a phony. I don't want my younger brother calling me a phony. I'm the oldest brother. What do you call Why am I a phony? He said, because you're the oldest brother, you should talk more like me than I do. He said, how come? When you go on television, you don't talk like me. I said, because if I talk like you, I'll make no money. <laughs> I'm not stupid. So the second lesson for success, the first is to make sure you take a good first impression. By the end of this day, you should have a different view of your own company, a different view of yourself, a different view of the customers. But the second point is to be willing to change. So many people hate change. Happiness is when you wake up and see your boss's picture on the milk cart. Now, <laughs> how many of you have any kind of supervisory role in this organization? Raise your hand. Raise them high. 
These are the people you were laughing at. So, I, Sergeant Preston's Law of the Yukon, only the lead dog gets a change of scenery. So on L. He takes care of 150 dogs. He knows every one of their sounds. So he can tell you which one is barking. And you can't tell who your customers are. You don't know their names. You don't know how many children they have. You don't know why he was good on the last loan and what he did with that money and why he needs a second loan. I thought it was interesting. 150 dogs by their sound. And, I, and he said, to, when I came up and I said, we're here, and he goes, Stanley, put two extra dogs on this sled. And I'm going, yes, we're going to go fast. Here. <laughs> and I said, are we putting two extra dogs so we can go faster? He said, no, you're kind of fat. <laughs> so much for Canadians being nice. You're kind of fat. I don't want to hurt the dogs. <laughs> He's got the opposite strategy. Tough times, you bring in more people. You don't get rid of people. What's your passion? What are you best in the world at? And what drives your economic value? I think it's such a shame that in organizations, people don't know what makes the company money. They don't know what hurts and what helps. And hopefully you're going to tell them that today, Bob, right? Okay. <laughs>